We sat down with 50 Cent in Los Angeles, California, and spoke to him about his inspiration, his motivation to record music, some of his industry rivals, and his new album, Before I Self-Destruct. The title of my new album, Before I Self-Destruct, is it's about the actual cycle of success from an artist's perspective. Generally, the general public builds artists and entertainers for the sake of entertainment and destroys them. It's just that point where you make it to where people feel like you're successful and you don't bear the same pressures they bear because you've acquired what comes with being a successful artist, a financial space, and it's a fair exchange, you know, and in exchange for some of the normalcy that the average person has, you know, you don't bear the, the financial pressure, but you do bear the pressure of people around you because they start to feel like you should do things for, for them. They develop a sense of entitlement that is almost impossible for you to live up to. It just continues, it's an ongoing thing, you know, and the, the actual album, the, well, the best example of it would probably be Britney Spears in a, a confused point when she's uh, swinging umbrellas and in turmoil for a, a short period of time in her personal life. It becomes the greatest show on earth because she's made it to such a prestigious point based on her art and work. They enjoyed that, you know. And I, I was just happy to see her work her way back from that because you know, a lot of artists don't make it back. Before Self Destruct was the title that I selected. I actually came up with the concept for this album before I released my third album. In between, like after my second album, I started playing with Before I Self Destruct as a concept and I started the Curtis project. And I ended up putting Curtis out because my grandfather is Curtis Sr. His firstborn is Curtis Jr. and I'm his first grandchild, which makes me Curtis James Jackson III. Because it was my third album, I felt like it'd be perfect. And I tried to have music that matched human emotions on the actual album creatively. I uh, created three songs that had laughter in them that I felt were capturing joy and I released Straight to the Bank as the first song off of that album that has the, I'm laughing straight to the bank with this. Ha ha ha. <laughs> I Still Kill embodied the aggression that was necessary to get by in the environment that I grew up in, featuring Akon and AO Technology had the sexuality that it would take to recreate people, you know, so in general I just broke down the different things that I thought was representation of, you know, human emotions. It's interesting, I'm inspired by probably the opposite of the average artist that comes from where I come from. Generally, they write the lifestyle that they would act, they inspire to have. Before I Self-Destruct has more imperfections than any project that I've released to this point. It has descriptions of my defects of character. I'm in a secure enough space to write those things. To give you an example, on Hate It or Love It, coming up, I was confused, my mommy's kissing a girl. Confusion occurs coming up in the cold world. And when I wrote that, I wasn't sure the public actually wanted to hear those things from me, so I placed it on Game's album instead of my album to kind of test it out to see what it felt. And it was a big hit, so it, you know, it made me confident enough to write other things that I hadn't you know, thought about actually putting in the material. Well, a lot of my fans might feel like they know everything about 50 Cent because they have more references to me and to my actual activities than the average artist because I'm more visible. I have more material out there in my body of work. Sure, this is album four for me before I self-destruct, but obviously I, I put out two, al two, mix two albums worth of material on the mixtape circuit waiting to release this album, War Angel and uh, Forever King. I need to slow down a little bit with the material that I offer them for, for free. I think they're becoming uh, spoiled a little bit by hearing the material and if I didn't offer that there was nothing there that embodied the aggression necessary to get by in the environment that I grew up in and in the cities there that lifestyle would make them anticipate what I have to offer now. When people have opportunity to really listen to Before I Self-Destruct they'll uh, compare it to Get Rich or Die Trying and, and actually say it's better than Get Rich or Die Trying because what I was doing on Get Rich was putting my experience in a nutshell. 
like PI and P, I've never physically had holes on the straw, but I had a friend that was exposed to the lifestyle that was close enough to me that felt like he wanted to bring me with him because I didn't have an pr issue with using a pistol. He wanted me in the passenger seat because financially he was moving into another space that he was kind of afraid of what could happen having that kind of money on him. That inspired that song. Actually, the first song that I wrote based on me being around him was As the World Turns. It was featuring Bun B and Pimp C from UGK, and I wrote that in 98. It was supposed to be for a 99 release, Power of Dollar. The next time that I wrote a song that kind of had pimping in it or that lifestyle was uh, You Should Be Here. It was a freestyle I wrote. Rafael Sadiq recorded the original song, him and D'Angelo. And I did it over and I put it out. And the edge that I had initially was there because I'd take things that people wrote trying to achieve commercial success and I wrote what directly would be effective in the environment that I was in because I didn't possess the ability to be marketed and promoted on a mainstream level. I had no interest in making radio records. They adjusted to that and I wrote I'm high all the time. I smoke that good shit on Get Rich or Die Trying. And I just knew that generally that would be expectations of the people that listen to my music based on everyone around me. Because everyone around me smoked that good shit. I was just the only one that didn't see uh, smoking $20 as if it was as important as having $20. Well, in between each project, you know, I get uh, a cloud to come over me that all artists get. You know, there's a shadow of doubt cast over you. Like, people don't generally believe in themselves. We'd have a problem. We'd have too many successful people or too many entrepreneurs. And on actual projects, in between time, they'll go, do you think you could do it again? They don't mean, do you think you can make good music? They're saying, do you think he can make us feel the way he made us felt the first time? But you don't have a second chance at a first impression. And my first impression was so strong, it made me the largest debut in hip hop artist today. And the album went on to sell 12 million copies. The largest selling hip hop album to release in 2009 is Eminem's Relapse. And it's at about 4 million copies. And Eminem's previously had projects that sold 23 million copies. So the roof of what you can actually do is change it. You know, it's not a reflection of the general interest of good music because people still enjoy themselves. They're just consuming it in a different way. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to putting out projects that make uh, people go, wow, I didn't expect that. He offers something again that we need. Because what I fell in love with initially in hip hop is gone. I don't see artists like uh, KRS-One. I watch so many different things happen. I watch Woe from Black Rob. That song had a moment that, it, like, as from an artist's perspective, and I was writing at that point. I wish I made that record. There's so many more opportunities to make things that match that actual time period that I think music marks time. I think when uh, you see that older person in your family dancing and they go, you don't know nothing about this young boy. They're thinking about when they were in the nightclub and they were in that age bracket where they were out partying and doing different things. So. They feel like you don't know nothing about it, even if they played it for you a million times. Our business is changing so, so rapidly, it's so different that, like, we used to respect the Source magazine. Like, there was a point where receiving five mics meant something. You know, that publication had uh, developed uh, an excitement within the hip hop community, and it made you know people interested to see how many mics you got. There's uh, labels placed on artists in hip hop that I don't understand because there was like, you're a conscious rapper. From my perspective, a conscious rapper is an artist that writes something that is, is smart. They would write something that was socially conscious. And my only conflict or problem with that label was I know exactly what the fuck I'm writing when I'm writing something that's aggressive. So I believe I'm conscious too. Now, they put me in the gangster rap section because of the aggression that's in the material that I actually write. But I sell more records than the guys that are there, so I guess I'm a pop artist. So I guess I'm just fucking confused. The music business is 
completely uh, it's different. Like you can't just create music anymore. The music business, the, the major record companies allowed radio to decide what they were going to play. When if they actually have the artist, they could have said, "No, you're going to play what we want you to play." They just was trying to make so much that they started to deliver the artist so fast that the record, that the actual radio stations were able to decide we're going to play this and we're not going to play the other ones. And you watch the radio departments trade people. Like, we're, we're going to give you this, and because we gave you 50 Cent, you got to take our other album. You see what I'm saying? We're going to give you 50 Cent for your uh, summer jam or for your Christmas jam. And because we're doing that, and you're able to give away tickets and to build this interest for listeners at your actual radio station, we need you to put this in. You know, it's always a, a bargain chip with the actual artist on different levels. So it's interesting. It's not payola. It's just a trait. I do you a favor, you do me a favor. I've been one of the consistent people that have generated interest from hip hop culture, which is now pop culture, because the music is so big. And me being willing to work is what allowed that site to be successful in the beginning. And then I named it thisis50.com, but it's about hip hop culture and pop culture, period. So everything of interest to that demographic is there. So no matter, even if I'm competing with an artist at the time, we put everything that they said derogatory about me, negative or positive, it all ends up there. And people look at it like a legitimate outlet for information and they, they check it out. So we're at a point where we get about 30 million unique views per month. BET, the number one music video on BET plays six times a week. So you spend about 400, Four fifty, four hundred fifty thousand dollars to make a music video they play six times a week. You know, if you don't catch 106 in Park, you miss it. You know, and virally, a music video like "Okay, You're Right" that I didn't bother to spend four hundred fifty thousand dollars on has eight million views. When they do see BET or when they do see the MTV show that shows music videos. They go on the computer and watch it as many times as they want. Afterwards, they're on thisis50.com or your YouTubes or those different spots that they know that they can find it. I, I try to do the things that make it as difficult as possible for piracy. When, when you would download a song in a few seconds, it's harder to download a film that's an hour and a half. Because the music is easier to steal, they steal it more commonly than stealing the film. And then you never have the actual experience that you would have going to watch a movie when you're looking at it on a computer screen that's about eight inches. So even if you saw the film there, I still want to go to the movies and, and see it on the big screen. Because I had the opportunity to write, produce, and direct my first film, I packaged it within the album so I uh, would have additional content and add additional value to it. And it was almost the opposite of what well, the normal process. And the normal process would be the feature film is completed and then they show artists or musicians the actual film and they create music that they feel like match the scenes. This was the opposite. I wrote a portion of the actual album and then I created like a synopsis, like a one sheet of what the film was about and then wrote the screenplay. So it had the content from the actual song in the film. I think that when people see it, they'll be surprised by it. You know, I'm, I'm excited, you know, for them to see both the album and the material that I put on the song. Because the song only allows you to make descriptions, writing the screenplay allowed me to develop the cause and effect to explain how a person could regress to that point where the things that are on the actual record come to them naturally. Well, production-wise, Dre offered uh, three songs on this actual album, and uh, one was song Psycho that he produced. We recorded in Las Vegas, featuring Eminem. We worked on that out, that one together. We did three, four records, and we used one that I felt like was, if not as good, better than Patiently Waiting for right now. And I'm excited to see how the public responds to that song. Because me and M work so well together, we kind of go back and forth on the record. So it's cool. and. Um, Away from that, we had Ty Fire, we got Havoc, 
obviously Polo on Baby By Me, which was my first single featuring Neil, and uh, Could Have Been You featuring R. Kelly. Rick Rock did a song called Stretch, which is like a really good uh, concept record for the actual album. And Rock Wilder. My next single is called Do You Think About Me? It's actually, the singles are telling the story also. So I had to start with Baby By Me before I got to the issues that come when a relationship is not going right. It's cool, I'm excited. Like this project is going exactly the way I planned it. This record is working the way I expected it to. And then we'll go to the next single and into the next phases on it. I address everybody who, uh, who openly challenges me. You know, it, it's just the competitive nature of hip hop in general. I think, you know, when, when you say MC is master ceremony or microphone controller, you had to be someone who uh, was willing to compete. And the competitive portion of hip hop makes it better. It makes good artists compete with each other to be the best actual artists. And if you don't have that, then what's really driving the art form? As far as Biggie and Tupac are concerned, I think that they're really great artists. And I think because artists are greater in their absence than they are in their presence, that only an idiot would attempt to make a comparison to themselves while they're physically still here to someone. Because people enjoy you with a, a stronger intensity once you're no longer here. And then it becomes monumental to them because they use you for their memories at that point, you know. So it's like saying that you uh, are as good as Michael Jackson, you know. And as soon as we lose him, you see it turn into Mike Mania. It's interesting. Like, I just, I wouldn't compare myself to those artists because they're great. Out of the two, I, I enjoy Biggie and his melody. But Tupac was a stronger writer than he was. You know, you could tell his writing developed from a poetry front. He was able to write a lot more and have a, a bigger body of work there after his actual death. But I think that had something to do with him being out on bail. Well, I'd like people to remember me as a great artist. I just, I'm having a good time being there because this is who I am. You know, like, a lot of people got to work to create a presentation, you know. But what I've offered the public is myself. I think there's four qualities that a star possess. That's quality material, performance, appearance, and personality. And right after you create, you can walk in beautiful. You know, we get that appearance, right? You create quality material. You can work on your performance. But if you have no personality, you're fucked. There's nobody who can fix that. And then there's a point that they send you right after you create those things, if they helped you with your appearance because the stylist put the clothes on you, and then they helped you with your performance because you had choreography and all kinds of things going on there, and then you had great material, A&Rs and great producers to help you with the material, and cool. Then they send you the media training. So right after you've offered what you had to offer, they tell you, okay, you did good, now be what something else. Not exactly who you are. Don't say exactly what, what you would say when it's time to answer the question. Say the politically correct answer so you don't fuck everything up because we're getting ready to spend this money on you. So make sure you say the right thing. And that's the part that I intentionally skipped. You know, because I feel like once I've offered myself to the public, there'll be other artists that come that are talented and better than me at things, but they won't be better than me at being me. I think if you ask who the greatest rapper is of all time, it depends on who you ask and you answer. It's each person's preference, you know, and their assessment of that artist's body of work, you know, because there is no best rapper, you know. I think there's no best songwriter unless we look at the performance of their song, and then that would be making reference to how the general public embraced it, and that would be the sales of the actual record, or we would have to look at how big the song was, and that would be a reflection of how radio embraced it. You know, so at different points, marketing dollars can make radio embrace something that isn't right. And they'll play it until we all know it, by heart, because they played it that often. It depends on the actual marketing campaign. So 
when you don't have those things, something organic happens. Like me making music on the street, like on a mixtape circuit, when it grows from there, like I, the, what I would, the worst scenario for me now was the best scenario for me then. You know, so right now, the bootlegging the material and me not actually having decent sales to point to and say, see, I told you I, it was good, then uh, that would absolutely be the worst scenario. And then the best scenario for me then would be for the bootleggers to bootleg it as far as possible so I can be exposed as much as possible at that point. So. It's interesting, like what I needed to get, get where I'm at now is what I need to not happen to stay where I'm at. I may hit a plateau because I still have a moral base that comes from the environment that I grew up in. And some of the people that I interact with in business have no spines. They have no base. They just, whatever works is what works and that's all that matters to them. I still got to do things from my gut. Every time I accomplish something, I reassess it, the situation and create new goals. I'll always want to move to the next level, but not at, at any cost. I've, I've in, interacted with people they would consider a complete gangsters. Just ruthless. And then I've met a whole new group of people that you would consider law-abiding citizens that are worse. Initially, when I, I signed Mob Deep and Mace and MOP, and these other acts, I was establishing Genet Records as an actual company. See, the public, we've had success with a lot of different albums, The Hunger For More, Get Rich or Die Trying, The Hunger For More, Straight Out of Cashville, Thoughts of a Predicate Felon, uh, Break For Mercy, TOS, a lot of different albums straight out of Cashville. But while those projects were successful projects, it really was just 50 and his homeboys to some people, you know? And then I took two duels that established themselves long before G-Unit's momentum or 50 Cent's success and put them on the actual label. And that turned it into a record company and an option in the minds of all of the artists that wanted to be a part of a company that understood their lyrical content and could market and promote it in a way that they would be satisfied with. Hip hop doesn't have a middle ground. It's either the artist that commands enough to actually entertain in a nightclub venue and a few artists that can command being in the actual stadium. So to bring it to the actual middle is to take all of them and put them in a space where they all get seen in the same light, where the music is all at the same level. And a lot of the tours, people don't realize it, but you go and the headline and act volume is louder than the acts that go on before. So you can't enjoy it with the same intensity. Like the fight is fixed, really. You know, so you go in there and you hear it, and even if it's a hit record and you're enjoying the performance, it's like when that head act come on, you feel a difference. You feel a shift in that production value. Well, my favorite songs off my albums are usually records that some people understand them and they listen to them and enjoy them because they've heard me say they're my favorites, but they're not usually the commercial singles. You know, like, on this album, Then Days Went By, is is one of my favorites. And then uh, So Disrespectful is one of my favorites. Like Because I get a chance to say really how I felt at different points on the actual record. So Then Days Went By is from, from me young, my life, and the actual how some of the things that I've seen, some of the things I've done. And I got a chance to flash from one age to this age to that age. And they may not understand exactly what the timelines are. They'll just hear it and enjoy it because it's, it's in the actual rhythm. Like people mistake my confidence for arrogance consistently. And it's because I have to bear more confidence than the average person. If I was average, no one would watch me. No one would listen to me. Just being in a celebrity space, 
you got uh, people to consistently judge you. They'll even watch this interview and have uh, something to say, you know. Right under it, they'll write a blog. Oh, fuck you, 50. <laughs> I'm cool with it. <laughs> Music business and entertainment in general is pretty demanding, and then my son's mom is even more demanding. I don't have a traditional relationship with my son, or one that you might uh, say has normalcy. When a person develops a sense of entitlement that you can't meet, you can only uh, hope they find something else that shifts their energy or changes their motivation. Because every day when they're not, their entitlement isn't met and they deal with the pressures the average person deals with, they develop an internal anger for you. And it gets deeper and darker every day, you know. Music is absolutely a priority, you know. Even the ability to to be a part of the other ventures and doing brand extension and came from the interest generated through music. And the finances obviously all allow you to be a part of that, but without the music, that wasn't there. You know, so when you come from, when you feel that, those feelings, when your music is done right, you never uh, get over that. Like it feels so great the first time that you become an addict and you, uh, keep searching for that feeling again. The way it felt, you know, when that first project was successful in the middle of he to get rich or die trying. Like when you make people change their minds. Like I Get Money did that for me during the Curtis album. You know, that record was dead right to my core. So they were like, all right, we'll get you next time. This shit is hot. You know, and they changed their mind and they started to to like the record and enjoy it because the other hits that were on there, I still had to launch those first because we all balance differently. Like there's certain things that Eminem can do as an artist that I couldn't get away with. Like if he decided he wanted to be joking an actual video and wear a dress, fine. Me in a dress, done. They ain't going for that. You know what I'm saying? Like that, just no space, there's no joke. They're like, what was, what was that for? You know what I mean? Like, they don't want that. And, and all artists got to know their boundaries separately, you know what I'm saying, and do it. Even from, from Kanye's perspective, he can make a pop record and just go with a pop record because his projects don't embody any aggression. No one's looking for that from him. When they'll go, oh, man, same record Kanye made. If I made it, still hit music, but we don't want that kind of hit music from 50 Cent. There was a point that I, I know everybody around me thought I was absolutely crazy. You know, it might be an, an inspiring story because I was sitting next to the actual radio and at that point I wouldn't actually write down the, uh, the lyrics. I'd just say it over and over to myself until I know it. When my grandparents came out, my grandfather came downstairs and he looked. I know he was thinking, what the fuck is wrong with him over there talking to himself? <laughs> and then he just went upstairs, you know, but it, 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 it was a point where I, I had to absolutely possess the ability to believe in myself when there was nothing around to support it. Just my gut, just the way I felt about it. And I stayed in that space long enough for it to actually happen. Because people might not be ready for you when you're ready when you think you're ready. I thought I was ready in 97, you believe that? Fighting with Jam Master J, I'm in the studio. I said, man, this shit is hot, I'm gonna blow up. <laughs> that was 97, then it was 98, then 99, then 2000, 2001, 2002. Six years later, it finally happened, you know. It took off the Wankster and then in the club. I mean, it's, it's been a journey, like it's, and it's not over, you know, I got a lot more to accomplish. I like to look at myself like I'm a work in progress.